We saw it in our first study of the epistle to Titus that according to one of the Cretan philosophers, Cretans were always liars, evil beasts, and idle gluttons. We then observed that each nation has its own national characteristics. And while believers uh, are not to be generally regarded as being simply uh, uh, a prey to the national weaknesses of the society in which they were born, nonetheless, we do still have our national strengths and weaknesses. And it's a good thing if we recognize them. We notice, therefore, from the epistle to Titus, God's way of taking even Cretans and making of them beautiful people. As far as their tendency to lie and not to keep their promises and so forth was concerned, the answer we found is in God who cannot lie and the way that God draws forth the faith of his people in his own character. As far as their being idle gluttons is concerned, we noticed again in chapter 2 how the grace of God teaches and disciplines us, and in particular, the hope of the coming again of Christ when we shall stand before him who is the great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And he will examine our works, because he gave himself for us, that he might purify himself, us from all iniquity, merely doing as we please and writing our own rules, and might purify unto himself a people for his own possession, one of these jewels, so to speak, in the whole universe, but in particular zealous of good works, and not only now, but for all eternity, of course. And the thought is that we shall have to stand before him, who gave himself for us for these reasons. He will want to know what good works we've done. And he is on record of having spoken more than one parable on this topic. It is not the uh, threat of punishment. It is the expectation of his grace. It is the fact, of course, that when he examines our works, if they are good, says 1 Corinthians 3, and survive his criticism, the work will survive, and we shall have a reward as well. If the work doesn't survive his criticism, it will be burned up, of course, and we shall suffer loss. But then, in that very passage, we are assured that the one who suffers this kind of thing, his works are burned up, and he suffers loss. He himself shall be saved, because his salvation never did depend on his works to start with. But you see, to have nothing to show for life, done for the Saviour, nothing to show for all eternity, that is to suffer a grievous loss, isn't it? And no reward? I have some friends, Christian friends, and they're very godly Christian friends and godlier than I am, who say that they are not looking for reward from the Saviour. They serve Christ simply out of love for him. They don't want any reward. Well, I take them at their word, do you see? I find it a little difficult 
when Christ has held out the prospect of reward to say, thank you very much, Lord, but I don't think, I don't know, I don't need that. Depends what you think of a reward. You see, here is a, a, a fond parents, and they have a six-year-old, and they determined that he should be an expert pianist when he grows up. So a six-year-old has to be at the piano 15 minutes a day practicing. As you know, a 15-year-old is difficult to persuade of the need to practice when he could be making mud pies or something of the sort. And uh, so mother holds out reward. If he practices, he'll get an ice cream or something. He gets it in his head that the reward for learning to play the piano is ice creams. Well, then he grows up and he gets to the age of 11 or so, and he's a considerable pianist. So he's kept up late one night when his mother has a party, because he's determined that her guests shall listen to her prodigious musician. That's her 11-year-old son, you see. And so he plays, and everybody claps and say never heard anything like it in all their lives, to a good effect, of course. He gets it into his head that the reward for playing the piano is applause from the people. And then he grows up and he gets, he gets bald and he's 55 and uh, made his money and uh, in all the busyness of life and the stock exchange, glad to get home at night. And he is to be found in his room by himself, playing the piano. What's the reward of having learned to play? Well, the reward is being able to play and make good music. There's a higher reward, maybe. And when he retires, he goes around the hospitals with some portable musical instrument and old people's homes, and plays to them, to give them some enjoyment. Mm -hmm. Reward, you may notice, as the passage, in the passages we quoted from our Lord's parables, the reward for using your ten talents was not a villa in Spain or something to retire to. It was more work. To be over ten cities. The reward is that you have increased your potential ability. You have increased your capital to be able to work more. But we come now to the last chapter, or comments on the first two have been scanty enough. And here they will be even more scanty. With one national weakness left, and that is the tendency to behave like wild beasts. Wild beasts, untamed will round on you and tear you to pieces if you let them. And these are people who likewise are very sensitive, as they say. Unfortunately, you can find people in Christian churches like it, who don't talk to them, who don't make the, faint, uh, the slightest uh, criticism or suggestion to them for fear they turn on you and explode. And how many times have many churches been ruined by ungodly fighting among believers? How does God propose to deal with that side of the problem, the wild beast in all of us. You say that's impossible. You might as well try to, to tame a rhinoceros or a hyena. But Paul has a different attitude. 
He says, put them in mind to be in subjection to rulers and to authorities, to be obedient and to be ready unto every good work, to speak evil of no man, not to be contentious, to be gentle, showing all meekness towards all men. Hopeless with Cretans? No, says Paul. For we also, you and I, Titus, we also were in time past foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. And you may think that for Paul to write this at the end of his career is exaggeration, of course, uh, but no, not when, he, not when he remembered what he was like, when he was highly religious. But he chased Christians, persecuted them, tortured them, prepared to have them executed, tortured them till they blasphemed the name of Jesus. That was Port Saul of Tarsus, the religious man. Kind of a wild beast he was, wasn't he? What made the change in us? How did God do it? Verse 4, but when the kindness of God, our Saviour, and his love towards man, that phrase, his love towards man, is in Greek philanthropy, though it meant then somewhat different from what it means now. It means literally the love of mankind, the love of man as man, you see, the human being. God's answer to this evil beast is his kindness and his love of mankind. And he's determined that for those who trust him, he will be our saviour to save us from the evil beast within us. How does he do it? Well, not by works done in righteousness which we did ourselves, much as we could take ourselves in hand, so to speak, and determine that we were going to be better and live better, we should not succeed, ultimately, if it depended on works done in righteousness which we did ourselves, as Saul of Tarsus found out, and he writes about it at great length in Romans and Galatians and elsewhere not by works done in righteousness which, us, uh, which we did ourselves, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing performed by the Holy Spirit, which he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So now in this chapter we come to the gracious work of the Holy Spirit. And as we observed in the previous talk, these three chap chapters concentrate on the work of God, the character of God who cannot lie, on the self-giving of Christ at Calvary to redeem us, the work of the Father then and of the Son, and here the work of the Holy Spirit, the regeneration, the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Now it is to, uh, of importance to observe that here in chapter 3 we are not spoken to about the death of Christ. Shall we notice that in chapter 3? Chapter 2 talked about the death of Christ, but not chapter 3. We're not here said to be saved by the blood of Christ or by his atonement. That, of course, was necessary and true. It's not what is mentioned here. Here we are being told God's methods for changing the wild beast within us. It's not a question of forgiving it, it's a question of delivering us from it. And here it's not a question, therefore, of the blood of Christ, 
it's a which is calculated to forgive us our sins. This is the Spirit of God and regeneration that is meant to produce a new character. And so that we can see the difference, allow me, if you will, to be as old-fashioned as I can and mention the Old Testament tabernacle. In the court of the tabernacle, there were two sacred vessels. One was the big bronze altar, the other was the bronze laver. At the altar, the sacrifices were offered for sins and other sacrifices, and the blood of the animal was shed. It was the blood that was taken into the holiest of all on the Day of Atonement. The blood for forgiveness of sins. In At the laver, there was no blood. It offered cleansing by water. And at that, the priests, when they were first inducted, were bathed all over. And then whenever they ministered in the holy place, they had to wash their hands and feet at that water. So the Old Testament offered both cleansing by blood and cleansing by water. That prompts us to ask whether the New Testament likewise talks about salvation by blood and salvation by water, cleansing by blood, cleansing by water. And of course it does. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, says 1 John chapter 1, cleanses us from all sin. And how it cleanses us is explained to us in Hebrews chapter 9. It's an important scripture to get hold of. How does the blood of Christ cleanse us? This is Hebrews 9, verses 13 and 14. For if the blood of goats and bulls, the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling them that have been defiled, sanctify to the cleanness of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience, from dead works, to serve the living God. The words are being used very exactly and mean literally what they say. The blood of Christ cleanses our conscience. Well, how does it do that? Well, it's not as if the blood of Christ were a detergent. The New Testament never speaks of our personal persons being washed in the blood of the Lamb. It will talk about robes that are washed in the blood of the Lamb, but not persons. If you come across a tomb in England, uh, do you see, where um, uh, it goes back to the Romans, you know, the Romans terribly oppressed Englishmen. Well, a lot of people have oppressed Englishmen all down the years. Do you see? Terrible. But anyway, uh, uh, this tomb has an, on it a, 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 a gravestone long since fallen down that says, washed in the blood. You will know the man wasn't a Christian. He was a follower of Mithras. And in Mithraism, converts were washed literally in the blood. They dug a big pit, they put the person inside it, they sacrificed a bull on the top of his throat and all the blood went down and... and uh, covered the person, they were washed in the blood. Hideous, of course. That was Mithraism, not Christ. The blood of Christ cleanses our conscience. How? Because when we sin and God convicts us of our sin, our consciences are affected and become aware that we deserve the penalty of sin, which is death, of course. And we can't do, uh, uh, cleanse that away by doing extra good works. We never should have done anything but good works to start with. 
So what can cleanse our conscience? The blood of Christ cleanses our conscience because it is the symbol and evidence of the death of Christ, whose dying as our sacrifice for sin has suffered the penalty. And because the penalty has been paid, our conscience can be cleansed, be free before God. And we have boldness to enter into the holiest of all. The blood of Christ, symbol of his death, on behalf of us, he died for our sins, paid the penalty of it. And when we see it, it cleanses our conscience and sets us free. Blood cleanses conscience. But now let us look to cleansing by water. To take an illustration, Ephesians chapter 5, And the verses that talk about the way husbands should love their wives, do you see? Uh, and it, is, it said, uh, as Christ also loved the church, verse 25, and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present the church to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. You notice here that there's no mention of sins as such. Uh, the metaphor drawn from a good lady, that though she's basically very beautiful, has developed perhaps on our cheek, a, a, a blot or a pimple or any such, no, no, nasty looking boil or something. And the husband noticing this, he doesn't say, well, my dear, I forgive you. Spots and blemishes are not things you forgive. He would uh, take steps to say that uh, she got the right medicines to put the problem right. Now these spots and blemishes, what are they when it comes to real life? They are defects in our character. They are not to be forgiven. They are there to be cleansed. And it's not, incidentally, baptism either. When our Lord spoke to Nicodemus about being born again, he said, born of water and the Spirit. And when Nicodemus said he didn't understand, our Lord gently chided him, being a professor of Old Testament in Jerusalem. He didn't know. What did he mean, didn't know? Well, God's program for the restoration of Israel, given in two chapters at great length in the book of Ezekiel, talks about those two methods. I will sprinkle water on them and they shall be clean. What do you mean, literal water? What, holy water or something? How will God do it? Take a big watering can and sprinkle all over Israel or something? Well, surely not. It was a metaphor even in... Uh, uh, Ezekiel's day, the sprinkling of water, do you see? And in a valley were pictured with full of dead bones, which is Israel, they had to be cleansed because otherwise they were defiling, so they sprinkled water on them, and now they needed new life. And the wind is summoned, but in terms that here and again, uh, 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 used, the Hebrew word ruach, for instance, is used, which can either mean wind or spirit. This is Israel reborn by water and the spirit. Nicodemus ought to have known it, he was professor of Old Testament, was he not? Except a man is born of water and of the spirit, the two sides to the spirit works. He convicts us of our uncleanness. But you see, then he has the other side to give us new life. That is a very important principle. 
If uh, you went to a cemetery and you say, I don't know what to do about all these old dead old bones here, um, smell rather bad. Well, you could if you wanted to, and got permission, dig them up and start scrubbing them. But what will good do that do? You could, however, if you wanted to, plant an acorn in the old tomb. And presently, the new life would begin to spring up. That is God's method. He gives us new life, you know, the washing of regeneration. New life implanted. That is God's method. And the constant renewing by the Holy Spirit. The cleansing by water to deal with not with the guilt of sin, but the defects in our characters. Repentance, therefore, as Christ in his word convict us of this is wrong and that is wrong, and so forth. But the final answer to it is, of course, that not only are we diligent to cooperate with God in the putting of it right, but the development of new life, that is the important thing. And not merely our own effort. <laughs> so that, um, hmm. there is, let me just mention, as an aside, there is a hymn, I love it very much and sing it with great gusto. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood. Well, I sing it with the rest, but that ain't true. If you're talking about our guilt before God, yes, there's power in the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ cleanses us from our uh, uh, sin in the sense of the guilt of sin. But if it's passion and pride we want to be dealt with, then of course that's by the water, isn't it? By the grace of the Holy Spirit and the new life and the development of that new life. Now when it comes to this uh, cleansing by water, we have one final lesson. We mustn't omit it because it's a lesson that our Lord himself illustrated. And we read of it in John chapter 13. At the Last Supper, you will not read in John of the bread and the wine and the institution of the Lord's Supper. It's not because John doesn't believe in it, but because God wanted him to say something else. He concentrates on another ceremony that our Lord enacted when he took uh, water in a basin, girded himself with a towel, and began to wash their feet. Do you see? And Peter, when he got to Peter, Peter protested, you'll never wash my feet, he said presumably thinking that this was something undignified for the Son of God to have to do, and Peter wouldn't allow himself to humble himself like it to wash his feet. Our Lord replied, if I don't uh, 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 wash you, you'll no part with me. Well, then Peter, going to the other extreme, said, well, not only my uh, feet, just hands and my feet, but my uh, all over. No, no, says Christ, Harris. <laughs> Peter. Uh, you see, uh, uh, he that has been bathed all over doesn't need thereafter except to rinse his feet, but is clean every bit. And the Lord's words, of course, were based on a custom of the day that everybody would have understood. If you had been invited to dinner at a friend's of yours down the road, you would, in respect of the invitation and the other fellow guests, guests, you would take a bath before you went. And then having taken a bath, you would walk down the road in your sandals. By the time you got to your guest's door, of course, your feet would be full of grit uh, with the road. I had no tar macadam roads in those days. Your host would supply a slave that would take you and wash your feet not give you a bath all over. Once you'd had the bath, that was enough, but would now rinse your feet. 
And that, amongst other things, is what our Lord was teaching. He taught other things by that same parable. But it's teaching us the two washings by water. The one that is bathing all over, that is a conversion, of course. Now you are clean through the word I've spoken to you. A bathing all over that never needs to be repeated. Regeneration. And then the constant rinsing of the feet. As believers, as we tread this dirty world and get defiled at our feet, so to speak, and we come to the Word of God and through the ministries of Christ and the Holy Spirit. We are brought to repentance about this or that or the other feature of our behaviour and seek the Lord's grace uh, to crucify the flesh with the affections and the lusts thereof. The two cleansings by water. The regeneration of the Holy Spirit and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, which God poured out on us abundantly. So, here is God's recipe for the dealing with the wild beasts, the wild beast in his people. Just let's sum it up by reading of these same things in one verse. This is now Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Notice which holy place that is. In the tabernacle, their first division was called the holy place. And then after the veil, the second division was called the most holy place. But when in the Old Testament the context makes it clear which of the two divisions is being referred to, and it is abundantly clear that the verses are talking about the holy place beyond the veil, then instead of calling it the most holy place, Scripture in the Old Testament will call it simply the holy place such as the high priest entered on the Day of Atonement, which must be the most holy place. And we have boldness, brethren, he says, to enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the way which he dedicated for us, a new and living way, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. We have a great high priest over the house of God. So let us draw near with the true heart in fullness of faith, now notice the next things. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Sprinkled with what? Well, chapter 9 that we read earlier will tell us. Sprinkled with the blood of Christ. In the Old Testament, you were not washed in blood, you were sprinkled with blood. So here, our, our, our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. And our body, our persons, bathed all over with pure water. What does that mean? Well, it means what our Lord said. He who has been bathed all over needs not thereafter except to rinse his feet. This is the bathing of regeneration by God's Holy Spirit. These are the basic requirements for entry into the holiest of all. Holiness, therefore, is no option. The same epistle to the Hebrews reminds us that we are to follow that holiness without which no one shall see the Lord. Thank God for the gospel. The holiness that is produced 
by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, born again of water and the Word, bathed all over with a bathing that does not need, according to Christ, doesn't need to be repeated. But then the question of perfecting holiness in the fear of God, holiness of both flesh and spirit. So Lord, may the Lord help us to understand and then to apply to ourselves his recipe for making beautiful people and give us such understanding that we may be able to help others who find the technical terms of the gospel a little difficult to understand. Thank you, Mr. President, sir.